I tell you, it's, it's always an awesome opportunity to start a new year, uh, to kind of begin again in some ways, and given permission to do that. Um, you know, some people have mixed feelings about New Year's resolutions and, and what they like to do. I, I love goals. I love objectives. I love having a direction and having a target that I'm trying to hit. And I, I think it really helps motivate me, and I think it really helps me accomplish things. So I, I, in, I embrace New Year's resolutions. I'm not always good at them. Um, you know, come along March, you know, I'm, I'm usually not talking about them anymore, but that's just me. I know that I'm the only one here that struggles with that. So I, I'm going to try something different this year. I, I was reading an article. I'm, I'm actually going to start my New Year's resolutions on February 1st. Uh, January 1st, because coming out of the chaos and the ups and the downs and the, you know, all the emotion and everything that goes along with the holiday season, with New Year's, with Christmas and all that, you know, usually I don't have accountability in place. I don't have a clear plan. I just know what I want to do and I haven't thought it through. So, you know, over the next three or four weeks, I'm really, in, you know, personally going to try to map out, you know, what I want to accomplish, what I think God wants in my life, how I want to work with my family and partner with my wife and, and my kids to be the family. Family that we feel like God wants us to be and to do those types of things. And so you know, February 1st is going to be my date. So I'm, I'm really honed in on that. And, and as I've thought about that, I thought, you know, gosh, one of the things that I often take for granted that I need to make sure of is that really God is at the center of my life. You know, because I, I don't know about you, but sometimes when I start thinking about who I want to be and where I want us to be, uh, sometimes I have already made plans and then I ask God to bless my plans instead of going, God, what are your plans for my life? Because I know what I want to accomplish. I know what I want to get. And God, sometimes life moves so fast. I just want you to bless them while we're in motion. And then uh, hopefully they'll be okay with you. But this year I, I want something different for that. And I really want to make it a, a personal part. And so in this, this sermon series, you know, this morning, for refocus, kind of getting back on track with the things that matter most, I think the one thing that, that I have to start with in this whole conversation about in the year that's ahead is, you know, where am, where am I spiritually? What is, how is my relationship with God? What kind of spiritual depth do I have? And, and, and for me in my life, I have to talk about that in terms of passion. You know, what's the passion in my life? And is God, is Jesus the passion of my life? And because it, whenever I'm passionate about something, it shows. And, and I thought about that. You know, if, if I sat down with, you know, with, with your loved ones, if I sat down with your family, with your kids, with your spouse, with your significant other, uh, maybe your parents, and I said, listen, you know, what's, what's his or her passion in life? I, I wonder what our significant others would really say about our passion in life. Would it be what we would want them to say? Would it be the truth? Um, or would it be God or would it be something else? I, I came across a story from a preacher named King Duncan, and he tells the story of a, of a person who really had a passion or more like an, an obsession. And he tells of a man, he was in a psychiatrist's office, and he was complaining about an obsession that was ruining his life. It's, a, it's golf, doctor. He said, please help me. Golf is destroying me. I can't even get away from it in my sleep. As soon as I close my eyes, I'm out there driving off the tee, watching it sail, or I'm on the putting green, making it for the win. When I wake up, I'm more tired than I was when I went to bed. What am I going to do? The psychiatrist sat back, folded her arms. First of all, she said, you have to make a conscious effort not to dream about golf. For example, when you close your eyes, try to imagine that you're at a party at which someone is about to give you several million dollars. The patient jumps back. He says, are you crazy? I'll miss my tea time. <laughs> you know, it's, it's a chuckle, but it's true, right? For some of us, sports is our obsession. It's our passion. We can't live without it. What is it in your life that you can't live without? What is your passion? Success, family, work, yourself, wealth, stability? The truth is our passions betray our hearts because it says in Scripture that wherever your treasure is, there will your heart be. And as I've said many times, if you really want to know probably what your passion is in your life, then just open up your calendar and open up your checkbook because if you can tell what your bank account says and what your calendar says, probably they will betray your priorities and your passions in your life. 
And even in church world, it's, it's dangerous as well because it's really easy for, for me as, as a leader and as a, as a person that is involved in the church world to make church my passion and not God. Because I know many of us, we can do the church thing. We can really get church down. We can come to worship. We can do Sunday school or small groups. We can make the committee meetings. We can do the mission work. We can do all of the right things in terms of religion, but miss out on the passion of the relationship with God. In fact, I have people who come to me and they're like, Pastor, I just don't know how to find that passion for my relationship with God anymore. I don't know how to develop that. I know how to do church, but I'm still trying to figure out how to live in a passionate relationship with God. In Luke chapter 10, a lawyer stands up and, and questions Jesus for all sorts of reasons. And I want to just share briefly the scripture with you this morning. It says, just then a, a lawyer stood up to test Jesus. And the teacher, he said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, what is written in the law? What do you read there? And the man answered, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus goes on later and says, that is exactly what you're supposed to do. Now go. Now, I love this passage because, you know, it would have been really easy if Jesus would have just said, listen, all you have to do to inherit eternal life is to believe in me. Or I am the only way to the Father. Or if you would just pray the prayer, this is your way to, eternal, to inherit eternal life. But no, he affirms two very distinct portions of the Old Testament that are brought together. He says, listen, these are redemptive in your life. If you want to experience abundance in your life on earth and eternal abundance with God and glory, then these are the two things that you have to keep in tension. You have to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul, and with all your strength, and you have to love others as you love yourself. So if I'm talking about my spiritual death, if I'm talking about getting my priorities straight, if I'm talking about building a passionate relationship with God, then Jesus says, listen, if you want to inherit eternal life, this is it. It's not just about believing, it's about loving, it's about serving, it's about being there. And it's not me who says it, it's Jesus, right? The way to abundance, the way to passion is to find that. You know, whenever I, um, whenever I became a pastor, you know, what's funny is, you know, I started whenever I was pretty young, you know, I guess maybe about, you know, what, 21 or 22, started doing this kind of pastor thing. And, you know, once people hear that you're a pastor, there's a, there's a sense of authority and trust and confidence that comes with that. And so all of a sudden, people start coming to me and asking me for wisdom or counsel or advice. And, you know, I'm still trying to figure life out. And, you know, for the early parts, you know, from the very earliest parts of my ministry, I had couples um, who were coming into my office or coming to visit me and saying, listen, pastor, we need help. And, you know, even earlier in my marriage, you know, whenever they would come and I was still trying to figure things out with my wife, you know, how, how to do this marriage thing, they would come and ask, you know, what happens when we, we lose that passion in between us? What happens when we, we don't feel that emotional connection anymore? And I started, you know, and I'd talk to them and I'd say, well, tell me, you know, tell me about that. And, and I would listen and I'd go talk to my peers and my mentors and I'd, you know, I'd read scripture. I'd start to reflect on my own personal experience and do those types of things and, and so I'd come back, you know, after a while, and I'd say, well, listen, tell me what it was like when you were passionately in love with one another. What, what did that look like? And, you know, one of them would chime up, well, you know, we used to talk to the wee hours of the morning, just talking to each other, talking about our dreams and talking about our love and talking about, you know, things that we cared about. We would ask each other questions about the smallest things and the biggest things, and, and we would listen to one another, and, and we would hear one another, and we would be excited for one another, and then we would spend time together doing all sorts of things, small things, big things, and then we would also do things that we didn't really like to do because we loved the other person, so if they wanted to do it, we, we just love to do it because we, we love them. And so we would go with them even if we care, care less about the activity itself. And we started spending time together, listening, asking questions, being engaged, you know, doing things and all that stuff. And, and then you would see sometimes whenever people would start talking about that stuff, that their eyes would light up. They'd start to, you know, get excited again. And I'd say, well, listen, why don't you just take a month, take, take 30 days and just go out 
and just do as many of those things as you can in the next 30 days, and then let's visit again. And what was amazing, not all of them, but a lot of them would come back and they'd say, Pastor Chris, thank you so much, man. When we started getting out, it was awkward at first because we didn't, you know, we had stopped listening to each other a long time ago. Or it was awkward because we, we, we forgot how to overlook doing something we really didn't want to do because we loved someone and we had to do it. It was awkward because we forgot how to communicate. But once we started to do that and going out on a date night or even having a sandwich on the porch or listening and, and absorbing and loving and talking for hours and doing those types of things, all of a sudden we began to feel emotions and a connection that we had lost. And sometimes whenever people talk about, hey, pastor, I don't know how to do this God thing. I don't know how to develop a passionate relationship with God. I think on some level, we have to treat it like a relationship with other people. If you want something out of that relationship, then you've got to invest in it. And you can't wait for the emotion to come. Sometimes you've got to start committing yourself to the relationship and understand and trust that sometimes the emotion will follow. The passion will follow. Somebody said after our earlier service, they said, Pastor, I, said, Pastor, I don't know. What would I do different? Ah, that's a great question. What would you do different? So, and they said, I don't know. What do you think? I said, don't ask me. Ask God. There's this beautiful thing called the Bible, right? We talk about it every Sunday. You can open that up. Start reading that. Start in the gospel. Start reading about Jesus. What does Jesus do? What would God do? He said, listen, I don't know how I would live my life differently, how I would spend my time differently. I said, great. Start reading the scripture, praying with your spouse, talking to your children. How would your life look different if your life were passionate about God? And if I wanted to pull your neighbor or your soccer coach, or if I wanted to pull your kid's teacher, or if I wanted to pull somebody, I would say, listen, what is their passion in their life? And what would that betray? What would that share? If you want that to be God, then those are the places you have to look. You have to begin to do those types of things. Cultivating a passionate relationship with God means making God a priority. And sometimes we have to live into that relationship and understand that by doing that, grace abounds and that God will cultivate that passionate heart in us. We just can't wait for the emotion and then believe that that's going to happen. Not all the time. Now, Jesus not only affirms that if we want to inherit eternal life, we must live passionately about God first. But he says you also have to love your neighbor as yourself. I don't know about you, but on a good day, I think about myself a lot. Right? I think that's the hardest thing for us. We are so self-focused in our culture. Lord, that, that's the reason we're so miserable. Sometimes I think that's the reason we need to serve more so we can stop talking and thinking about ourselves, focus on other people. And I, I'd be, it'd be amazing how, how, how miserable, we, how, better we, how much better we would feel and less miserable we would feel if we focus on other people. But Jesus says, he says, yes, that's right. Love someone as yourself. Albert Schweitzer was speaking to a graduating class at a college in London, and he said, some of you will be highly successful. Some of you will make a lot of money. Some of, you, some of you will rise to places of prominence. Some of you will be adorned with titles. But I promise you this, only those of you who learn to serve will be happy. It's a real key to life, learning to serve. Jesus says that part of experiencing God's redemptive grace is in loving those around us. James White is a great preacher told of Anthony Campolo, who, uh, who's a teacher at, a univer at Eastern Pennsylvania University, and he belongs to a predominantly black church in, in Philadelphia. And Campolo tells this story of Student Recognition Day at this church. And he says, uh, hey, the, children, the students would come forward and they would share their dreams and their plans. I'm going to be an attorney. I'm going to be a physician. I'm going to be a professor and so forth and so on. And, and while they're doing all this, the preacher is becoming increasingly agitated and, and nervous and impatient. And then finally, when they're all done, this preacher who's been doing this for, gosh, 30 or 40 years stands up. And he says, now, my children, before we go home, there are a few things I need to say. He said, now, young people, you have lots of goals and dreams and ambitions and plans for your life, and that's nice. He said, but let me tell you something, and I want you to listen closely. One of these days, you're going to die. And they're going to take you out to the cemetery, and they're going to drop you in a six-foot hole, and they're going to throw dirt in your face, and they're going to go back up to the church, and they're going to eat potato salad. He said, listen. I know that was pretty harsh, wasn't it? <laughs> he said, listen, when you came into this world, everybody was laughing and you were the only one crying. 
He says, now when you go out of this world, the question is whether everybody else is going to be crying and you are going to be laughing. The whole thing hinges on this, on whether or not you are going to live your life for titles or for testimonies. Young people, he said, don't live your life for titles. He says, that's small stuff. Live your life to be a testimony, a testimony to Jesus Christ a testimony to God's unconditional, unfailing love. He said, make a difference in, a wor- in the world. And I want to tell you, my brothers and sisters, it's, it's true. I've done hundreds of, of funerals since I, in my short career, probably more than I should have or wanted to. But what I've noticed is you can always tell in a funeral when somebody has passed and they were only concerned about themselves or their family. You can always tell when titles and and, and stuff were the focus because those are the short services where there are very few few tears shed and people come in and they go out and then they have the lunch afterward and then they go home. But if you really want to know a service of someone who makes a difference, it's someone who invested and served and because of that had created testimonies of people who would come up. I've had people who come up, lines of people, and said, listen, I want to say something about this person's life. I want to share something about this person. Can you, pastor, let me speak for just a minute to the impact this person has made in my life? And so I, I think the, the, the sentiment is there. You know, if we live for titles, fine. That's the small stuff. And whatever we get on earth... That's fine, because in heaven, that's nothing, right? This is for us. But if we want to live for something significant, if we want to experience the grace of God, if we want to have meaning in our life, if we want our life to transcend just what this world offers us, then we have to be able to look in and say, listen, how is my life creating the opportunity for people to give a testimony to the love and grace of Jesus Christ that's been lived through me? How is my life going to make a difference? And how am I going to make that happen? My hope and my prayer this year, my brothers and sisters, is that in the year to come, as you set your direction, as you set your goals, as you set a dream for what you want life to be like and what you want to have accomplished when we get to this time next year, my prayer is this, that you will make God the passionate center of your life. That you will live that relationship in such a way that people will know where your heart is. And that when you love, that the love that you have for God will pour out into the lives of people around you. And that because of your life, there will be testimonies that will come forth from people that you will interact with and engage and love and serve and work with over this next 12 months. That whenever and your day comes to whenever you go meet your maker, that there will be people who will be lining up, not because of you, but because of what God did through you to attest to the love that God showed them through you. That's my prayer. Let us pray. Gracious Father, it is so easy to get caught up in all the small stuff and to to somehow believe that those are the most important things. But God, we pray that as we consider the passions of our life, as we consider the truth of our work, God, that in all that we do, God, you would recognize and live through us. That our love would resonate in the lives of the people around us and would create the opportunity for a testimony to the power of your grace. God, we pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen.